I started with my father, Henry Reeves Jr., uh, you know, who I would say was probably the, one of the greatest fathers ever in the, in the history. Mm -hmm. And I would say when I was about nine years old, mm -hmm. you know, he got addicted to crack. This is a journey. Let me take you on a journey. There will still be the journey. The journey. New Sheriff in town, and the name is the journey. Journey. This thing is bigger than Nino Brown. This is the journey. The journey. What is it that moved you? The journey. The Journey Memphis is being generously supported by Nike's Black Community Commitment and Methodist Laboner Healthcare. Welcome to another episode of The Journey. I'm your host, Larry Robinson, and today, y'all gonna, gonna listen to us one of these days. Because listen, we have one of the baddest, most amazing icons that we've had on the show. But before we get there, we're gonna get to our quote. And our quote is from the great great Tina Turner and it goes a little something like this whatever is bringing you down get rid of it because you'll find that when you're free your true self comes out so you want to shake off those shackles so you can be all that you can be today's guest or icon is true personification of that brother went through a little bit well let me just tell you first and foremost he's a Memphis native but he went to high school in Mississippi. Veteran, um, husband, father, entrepreneur, and I'm telling you his empire and footprint is growing and growing and growing. But listen, I'm gonna let you, let you find out even more about him. Today we have attorney Henry Reeves on the journey. What's happening, brother? Oh man, nothing man. Happy, happy to be here, man. Honored we to are be here. honored to have you here, bro. So listen, we're gonna jump right in. Tell me about early years, and what do you remember about the community that uh, you were raised in? Man, well, I know one thing, I, I moved around a lot, so okay. in between uh, kindergarten through 12th grade, I was at 12 different schools. What? And so, uh, you know, I was born in Memphis, had a hometown in Mississippi, but my father, you know, started off in the Navy, so mm -hmm. I was in Oakland for a while, and San Diego, California, and Japan, and. Uh, but I say my hometown back in uh, Mississippi, it's okay. a little place called Dead End. Dead End, uh, yeah, Dead End, right Mississippi. In, yeah, right in Benton County, Mississippi. My neighborhood was called the Dead End, and it was just right outside of Holly Springs. Okay. And so just growing up, uh, you know, there, uh, you know, we kind of grew up during the crack epidemic and, and, and things like that. So okay. uh, it was a very unique you know, it was a very unique time. It's a very unique experience. Okay. I think that a lot of uh, uh well, hold on, we gonna we gonna get there. to it. We gonna we gonna we gonna get to it. But we gonna yeah. unpack that in the second half. So yeah. make sure y'all keep uh, stay right there because we got some more to talk about on that topic. But listen, who outside your parents had the biggest impact on young Henry Reeves? It would be my grandparents. Oh, okay. I mean, okay. It, it definitely would be. Uh, you know. Like a lot of us, spent a lot of time with my grandmothers. You mm -hmm. know, my grandmother, Geneva Reeves, she mm -hmm. was a, uh, a professor at Russ College oh. and also a teacher at Ashland Middle School, an educator, very involved in the Civil Rights Act. And my grandmother, uh, Frances Alexander, you know, okay. and she worked in the fields and she you what know, about raised their children. What about them resonated with you? I think the thing, one of the things that uh, resonated about them is just the unconditional love. You okay. know that they they kind of had for me, and mm -hmm. and they were just just as proud as they could be of me. I you know I had done nothing, and so mm -hmm. uh, you know they cared for me and they loved me and they showed me what love was. Oh wow! Okay, okay. So, what decision? You know, because we all make these have these impactful decisions, but you don't even realize they're going to have a, a lifelong impact when you're young. What's the decision that you made as young Henry Reeves that ended up? Like, man, this is really was an important thing that I did. I think uh, deciding to be obedient. Uh, you know, my father basically told me I was going to the military and oh. I didn't, it wasn't, wasn't a, a choice that I had. And he told me and I was obedient and I did that. And I think that's one of the greatest decisions, uh, you know, of my lifetime. Uh, my mm -hmm. grandmother, you know, during the crack epidemic, having a grandbaby raised in that. You know, there's a lot of things that we didn't have, but she begged me, like, don't sell crack. Don't be, don't run the street with them guys. Don't do it. And I was obedient to my grandmother. And I wasn't out here, mm -hmm. you know, selling crack and doing certain, you know, things. So I think my obedience, 
you know, saved me and, right. and really helped me out. Right. Wow. How different are you from the person you dreamed you would be? You know, I used to dream I was going to be an NBA player, <laughs> but I yeah, obviously not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I think, uh, you know, I had a, I had a, a cousin, you know, Vandal Bland, and mm -hmm. he's, a, he's an attorney even right now in West Helena, uh, Arkansas. And, uh, you know, during that crack epidemic, all the crack dealers, they had, you know, cutlasses and regals and Europeans, and he had a pearl white, like, Lexus. Is the bubble eye one thing about it, been like a GS three hundred, and it was sitting on chrome. And right. so, uh, you know, he gave me inspiration of something different and something new. So I wanted to be a lawyer when I was when I was young. When I was a little boy, I know, uh, being in San Diego, going downtown, seeing the men in suits and stuff like right. that. And to me, that was like seeing a, a superhero or NBA player. So, you know, God actually allowed me to, you know. Uh, achieve the things I want to achieve now mm -hmm. he also allowed me to you know take it to heights that I didn't envision right right wow wow what's your why Henry what's your why why you get up every day and make Man, fight my, this fight I mean my my way my why you know right now it, it really you know boils down to my faith in Christ you okay. know my, my faith in uh, Jesus Christ and I just really want to uh, put myself in a position to be a part of whatever his master plan is mm -hmm. like the days of me deciding what I want to do and where I want to go and you know me making the decision for myself that's over so I've you know pretty much come to a complete place of uh, submission and mm -hmm. it's just uh, pretty much I'm seeking you know where do you want me to go what do you want me to do and I'm gonna follow because I know when God calls the shots Man, the place that I get in in the end is a much better place. Right. Is there an event that happened in your life that made you say, you know what, I'm going to submit? I mean, I think, uh, you know, one of the things, the biggest things was uh, uh, the pandemic, uh, mm. maybe just right around uh, 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 2000, because, uh, like, you know, as an entrepreneur, is uh, kind of when you're starting, from the bottom and you're building you're in such grind mode right that uh you know you look up and you realize like wow this is how far you know how far i came mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. up until 2000 i was just in complete up until 2020 i was just in complete grind mode and so mm -hmm. i didn't get a chance you know i'm working the 13 hour days you know five days a week and six days a week and you know whatever i need and i'm working to exhaustion and stuff like that the thing that the pandemic kind of did it, it kind of allowed me to slow down okay. and then i load i got to slow down and i was alone you know and i was in isolation in the subdivision that i uh, lived in we had a lake so i would go out to the lake and i can sit and i can mm -hmm. meditate and i can you know just kind of think and i uh you know i during that time I, I reflected about how much stress and how much pressure i had on myself a lot mm -hmm. of times when you're an entrepreneur if you're not careful like you kind of feel the burdens of everything and you feel that any decision that you make if it's the wrong decision the whole empire crumbles down right you know you got all these people who are dependent on you you got yeah. all these employees and you're thinking about their family and you're thinking about man they made a sacrifice they trusted in me they trusted in my dream and they right. came and they worked for me and now you know if i make this wrong decision is it all gonna fall down what are people gonna think about me mm -hmm. man i got a black business people in memphis i can't leave outside of uh, my house without someone saying man i'm proud of you reeves and stuff right. like that so right. i had that pressure man well, i can't let well, hold on we're gonna we're gonna do that even more because as an entrepreneur as a fellow entrepreneur you're speaking my language brother Bert. You said something about being a black business, but I want to take you back. When was the first time you really realized you were a black man? Mm. I, I, hold on, hold on mm. for a second. We're going to come back on the journey. Just keep your butt right there because I'm telling you, this is going to be powerful. Where Brother Reeves is going to share with us when he realized he was a brother. Be right back on the journey. This is a journey. Let me take you on a journey. Success in life is not a straight line. There are twists and turns in everyone's life, and the more you know about their story, the more you'll understand the process. Kazukian Media Group proudly presents The Journey, a show that features successful black men in Memphis telling their stories of their lives and the ups and downs they've encountered on their ultimate road to success. 
We believe the journey will encourage young men and help them see that life is a journey. Watch the journey hosted by me, Larry Robinson. Brought to you by the Kazuki Media Group in partnership with the Delta Boule. I told you, I told you, I told you, I told you, this is gonna be a barn burner. So listen, before we left, Brother Henry Reeves was gonna share with us that, the moment that he realized that he was a black man. So Henry, go ahead, man. Man, I, I think uh, like my identity as a black man, it was instilled you know, very early because my grandfathers uh, were civil rights leaders. My grandmother was a civil rights leader. Mm -hmm. And my father, he experienced, you know, growing up in Mississippi, you know, during the 50s and 60s. So he always let it be known. But, uh, you know, me personally, like my experience, it would probably have to be like sixth grade. And I had a little friend. He was a little uh, a white guy. I was in mm -hmm. San Diego. And I'm talking about, we, man, I was spending the night at the house. We played video games and everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then we end up going to sixth grade camp in California. You know, the kids in sixth grade, they go to a sixth grade right. camp up in Palomar Mountains. And uh, we got out there and we got around all the mother kids. And, uh, you know, he turned on me like, man, you know, wow. I, don't, I, I ain't friends with niggas, you know, like that. And, uh, you know, I... I hit him, of course. Right. But like that was like one of the first times. It's like, man, I got There's flipped a on. Like I, I didn't, I didn't know. And so it was, it was kind of young when I had that experience to know that it was a, a okay. difference. Okay. Man, let's go back to your childhood, man. Mm -hmm. What was family life like back in Mississippi? Oh man, family life. It was, you know, it was, it was really good. Like anyone, uh, you know, when I talk about my childhood, mm -hmm. it, it's kind of in, in different phases because I, I started with my father, Henry Reeves Jr., uh, you know, who I would say was probably the, one of the greatest fathers ever in the, in the history. Mm -hmm. And I would say when I was about nine years old, mm -hmm. you know, he got addicted to crack. And so, you know, we come from... Wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah, I was about... I was Wait a minute, this nine. is after the military? This was during the military. This is like while he was in the military. Whoa. Yeah, this was like while he was in the military. It was, this was uh, you know, and the story is like my grandfather passed mm -hmm. and it was after his funeral. You know, he went back home. He's in Mississippi. He's stationed in California. He goes back and after my grandfather's right. funeral, you know, with some people, that's when he tries crack for the first time. And it's a very precipitous, you know, drop. Right. Uh, you know, ends up abandoning the family and it's, uh, and now I'm raised with my mother and it's my mother, right. you know, just from Mississippi, we in California, you know, the whole welfare and, uh, you know, oh, section eight and man. commodity. And we're able to, you know, we had to a kind of experience through that. But the thing about it is in America is like, so many black people go through it. <laughs> it's <laughs> like, it, it, it didn't seem like something that was like uh, a, an extremely hard time or anything because everyone around me was going through the same thing. Like literally during the but crack epidemic. But this was epidemic, your dad though. It's my dad, but everyone's dad was smoking crack. And our, everyone's mama was smoking crack. Our, everyone's dad was in a penitentiary for smoking crack. So it's like, was in a penitentiary for selling crack. So right. it's just, you know, as I was going through it, it was just, you know, just kind of par for the course. I didn't, it didn't seem. But mm -hmm. now, you know, as I'm raising my kids, right. and I'm going through and I look at my kid who's like 10 years old, right. and I'm like, man, what would it be like? How traumatic would it be right. if like I started smoking crack and he's coming home and, you know, I'm taking the TV off the wall or I'm, oh, I'm taking the car, man. I'm stealing the car, or I'm, I'm robbing his mother, or, right. you know, like things like that. Like I, I you know, hindsight, I look back mm -hmm. and, I, and I know that it was like nothing but the Lord that was carrying me through that because I didn't feel it, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like that. I didn't feel like, man, I got to kill myself. I'm so depressed. Right. Oh, what I'm going to do? Like, right. I didn't I didn't have that. Was know, that was that, that due to the family structure, the grandmother, grandfather? Was that oh, who yeah. stepped in? It was a family structure. Um, I was surrounded by love and they also, you know, uh, 
a lot of times they try to make it as a negative thing about mm -hmm. black people in church or, you know, black people are too religious or things like that. But I can truly testify that it was, you know, the involvement in the church and the numerous testimonies and me hearing about God and how he is enough and Bible his school. grace is sufficient. <laughs> and I felt like that helped me uh, right. tremendously. Right. Wow. So I'm sure that was a pretty traumatic experience. Let's yeah. talk about one of those moments that you think back and it just brings a big old smile to your face. Mm -hmm. What's a moment in young Henry Reeves' life, life mm -hmm. that you can think back on and be like, man, that was awesome. Oh, man. Uh, just as, as many of the uh, negative memories I could remember, mm -hmm. I remember the positive memories. I remember, you know, us being stationed in Japan and my father you know, taking us to Tokyo Disneyland or taking us to Knott's Berry Farm and, uh, you know, in, in Six Flags. I remember saying that I wanted to run, uh, that I wanted to play football. And uh -huh. my father, you know, waking me up at, you know, five o'clock in the morning and we running hills and I'm 11 years old. And when oh. I wanted to go to the military, you know, my father getting me ready, you know, cutting down like logs and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, we have like telephone poles on mm -hmm. our shoulder, just like running you know, right. for miles. So one of the things that bring a, a great memory to me is like when I had him and when he was there, when he was present, is uh, just knowing that I got someone who's willing to die for me. You saw, some, you saw him come out of crack. I got to see him I got to see him come out of that and his was a, it was unique because uh just about his willpower he came out of crack smoking it and started selling it. <laughs> and I was and so like it's usually it's usually the opposite. Right, you right, start right. Start off selling it and, and then, then they try yeah. and then they smoke it. So right. he did that and so but uh you know he ended up getting a, a, a you know criminal charge and I had to run and get the money for his lawyer and then mm -hmm. it was kind of like at that time you know one of the lawyers there is a, a white guy out in Ripley Mississippi Jim Panel he was like man I'm gonna tell you man if it was a black lawyer around here he would clean up you know wow. they had a black option and so you know after that after he had that run in he uh you know went back to Christ and he started preaching he was actually a pastor you know, wow. <laughs> yeah, after after all that, you okay. know, he was a pastor. And so the grandfather that my children knew, you know, is a completely different. Like they, they didn't have any of the, of the negative aspects. Right, it right. was just, you know, it was just Paw Paw. That's amazing. That's yeah. amazing. Tell me about your transition to adulthood, mm -hmm. man, because you down in Mississippi, you ended up going into the service. What was how? What do you remember about? that transition going from a boy to a man so, oh man I, I just know it's uh lots of hard work you know lots of uh, uh sweat but i as i look back i just see a lot of times that i was protected uh you know from from making the wrong choice mm -hmm. or when i did make the wrong choice god provided enough grace to me that it didn't affect me you know for it didn't affect me for life it didn't prevent me from you know re mm -hmm. having my future wow made you want to have your own business um i didn't necessarily want to have my own uh business when it comes to the reeves law firm um as a young boy i was always a businessman i was always an entrepreneur I, okay. you know i, I kind of had that in me but like the reeves law firm was truly wouldn't anyone else give me opportunity like i worked for the insurance defense side i've been mm -hmm. on that side right and then i went and i interviewed with morgan and morgan interview nst interview with the car confirm right and because i knew i wanted to switch and be on the other side right and i just no one would give me that opportunity and so, so it, it, it came to a point where i had to make my own i had these my children i have my family i'm gonna feed my family what i'm gonna do is sit mm -hmm. up here and cry right want to you know, <laughs> worry about because another man won't help me out. Right, right. So, you know, that's kind of what pushed me to, to start my own. And once I did start it and the momentum, you know, started going and stuff like that, it just became apparent to me that, like, this is the path the guy wanted me on. You, you mentioned your family. Tell me about your wife. Man, my wife, uh, Neva, man, she, uh, I say that's definitely my my partner. That's my everything right there. Uh, okay. We met when we were in. Uh, we met actually in church uh, in Twenty Nine Palms, California. Okay. Uh, and I was that was maybe almost twenty years ago. How'd you know she was the one? 
Man, I, <laughs> I'm gonna say, I think I was with her for a while. Uh huh. And I was with her for three years, four years, and I was getting ready to go to law school, and I just like really couldn't imagine not being with her. Okay. You know, okay. I didn't want to. I didn't want to start back over again. I didn't want to find and you know. It wasn't the chicken sandwich or nothing like that. No, man. It was just <laughs> you know she was there. She had a similar background uh, okay. to me. You know, she kind of gone through the same you know the same types of trauma. Right. And uh, you know, like me, she was also like the one in her neighborhood that made it out. She's the most successful with her cousins you know she made it to college okay. you know she had a baby uh you know in in high school she was like 15 or oh, wow. you know something like that and her mom smoked crack and she had to live with her grandmother and okay. you know and she was still able through all that she was still able to you know graduate from high school you know some of the best grades and go to college and mm -hmm. uh end up with a master's degree and like just her drive and who she was she motivated me and so all my weaknesses and the things i'm more of a visionary and she's more of an integrator she makes the stuff happen and so it's just a perfect uh handcrafted helper to get that together. rocket fuel in there oh she threw that rocket fuel and she uh you know when i was going to law school when i was not going to law school when i was prepping there's a test called the LSAT that you right. have to take to get into law school right and so she was taking like her tax returns and stuff like that and giving it to me to pay for these courses like thousands wow. of dollars so she was also putting her money <laughs> you know yeah. where I'm she was invested so she in was it, yeah. she was invested in, and I, I think that the investment paid off for it though fantastic <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about your transition to Memphis mm -hmm. you came back to Memphis mm -hmm. What has Memphis meant to Henry Reeves? Now we know what Ashland and Mississippi meant. Yeah. What did where did Memphis what role did Memphis play in your development? Man, Memphis my birthplace, born in St. Francis, right there okay. in nineteen eighty. And uh Memphis made me. You know, Memphis made me. For me, Memphis, uh, a lot of the part of Memphis, especially like the White Haven area mm -hmm. and stuff like that growing up. Mm -hmm. You know, if we want to go to the mall, like that's where we went. We went to Southland Mall, and okay. and when we were thinking of what does someone with money look like, you know, we were thinking about Twinkle Town, right? You know, and that's right. that's kind of the generation I was growing up. So Memphis was always this aspirational like city on the hill. Cause you got to think, I'm a kid coming from the dead end. Now, right. People in Memphis, you know, they might talk down on Memphis, and you know, they might not see everything that Memphis has mm -hmm. to offer, and they may not see the beauty of Memphis, and they may not see that. But man, we talking about a kid from the dead end of Mississippi from the poorest state in the poorest county in the poorest state you know when I'm sitting up in in class and we don't have heat during the winter oh, <laughs> you know what I'm wow. saying and, and we don't have AC during yes. the summer and you know I'm, I'm going through this I always kind of saw the opportunity in, in Memphis and the thing about Memphis is they get behind the winter and they get behind realness so if they feel that you're real if you come across as real and genuine, Memphis going to wrap their arms around you and they'll embrace you. And uh, that's what Memphis kind of did for me. Memphis, without a doubt, Memphis made me. Memphis supported me. Memphis is a city that I was able to be myself and be free. Right. I didn't have to come up here. I didn't have to do no cooning. I didn't have to, you know, be somebody else. I could wear locks. I could put my fist up. I could do whatever. And Memphis is always just, you know, they've been with it. Hey, man, that's good stuff. Great success. What's a great success of an of the older to date? Because I'm sure your greatest success is still ahead of you. Mm -hmm. But a great success that you would point to at this stage of your life. Uh, I think one of them would be uh, being recognized as the executive of the year for the Memphis uh, Business Journal. Okay. And so you know that's a uh, that one was a big one. That one is kind of validating. Uh, you know, a lot of the things that I'm trying to do. Uh, when you look at from the law firm aspect and stuff like that, and you look mm -hmm. at the success, a lot of people would try to say, they might say, well, it's just because he's black, or it's just because it's billboards, it's just because it's advertising. But to be, you know, reviewed by, uh, you know, my peers and to look right. at my business as far as the business acumen, as far as, you know, my ability to run a business, to look at marketing, to look at operations, mm -hmm. to have systems work together and to be recognized is not a top black CEO in right. Memphis, but as a top CEO, the top executive in the city of Memphis right. by uh, the Memphis Business Journal, who's been doing this for over 75 years. Right. I mean, that 
to me, I feel is a is a, a great accomplishment and a large accomplishment, and uh, I, I think that would probably be it. Fantastic, fantastic. Any regrets? Let's see, um, what would you the, do? The, over I that? think the regret, one regret that I would that I would have is spending so much of my time being a slave to the opinion of others. Mm. Like like spending so much of my time really caring about like what this person thinks about me or what this person, you know, says. Because what that kind of does is it puts you in a situation where you can be manipulated. Mm. You know, that's what that's that's really what that does. You know, you're not free if you're just really, really caring. And it got to a point of just really, you know, getting to a point where, look, I know myself. I mean, I know my motives. I know why I make this move. I know why I do this. I know that my intentions are pure. You may not. Right. You right. know, but like I'm not going to be tossing and turning and losing sleep because of some way that you feel about mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. And I think that once people really accomplish that, that's one thing that makes it so hard for kids. Because, like, when, and kids, like, what their friends think is everything. Right. What right. their friends think is everything, everything. And then, plus, in this society that we're being raised in now, like, with social media. Right. Like, man. Like how many friends you have on social media, like that affects how you feel about yourself. How many people like this comment? How many people laugh at this meme? Like, you know, we're constantly putting ourselves out there mm -hmm. and letting imperfect people decide what we feel about ourselves. Wow, that's so. powerful. Mm -hmm. He keeps talking about free. You wanna be free. So, we coming to the end and I want you to leave these young men or young boys or even young ladies a Henryism, something that they could carry with them from this conversation. And I want you to say it in that camera. Talk directly to them, Henry. The All floor right. is yours. Man, things are gonna happen in your life and you're not gonna be able to control them. Bad things are gonna happen. And the thing that you must do is focus on the aspect that you can control. What can you control? When something bad happens, the thing that you can control is the way that you're gonna use it. My father smoked crack. I could have used that as an excuse to say, you know, man, forget the world. You know, let me go down this corner. I should be able to sell crack too. Someone's selling my daddy crack. How come I don't sell crack? But instead, you know, the way I choose to use it is I would never sell crack because I see how devastating it is, you know, firsthand because I could see what happened to my father and how it destroyed my family. And as you go through life, there are going to be a lot of these different situations that pop up. And you do not have control if your mama gets killed, if your dad goes to jail, if if you lose your job, if your girlfriend cheats on you, if your husband does this or whatever. A lot of those things you cannot control, but you can control what you do after and how do you use that. And make sure at all times that anything that the devil throws your way or anything that life throws your way is you're going to use that as something that's going to elevate you. You're going to use it as fuel. You're going to turn that burden into a blessing regardless of what they intended it for, for it to be. And so just remember that y'all, control the things that you can control and use everything that comes into your life as fuel, not as, uh, not as an obstacle. That's from me to you. Wow. I told you, I told you, I told you. Keep coming back, keep coming back. I'm Larry Robinson and for my guest, Brother Henry Reeves, yes, thank you. Oh, thank thank you, you for sharing your time, thank you. your, 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 your emotion, your thoughts, because we need it. We need man, it. Man, I, I got to definitely give my flowers to you, man. Like, I've personally, you know, witnessed a lot of your voyage, and I've just seen, you know, where you were, 
you know, and I didn't even see the beginning, the beginning, the beginning, the beginning of where you were, but uh -huh. I just saw where you were just years ago, you uh -huh. know, and where you are now and coming to the studio and seeing the amount of people who you're giving opportunities to, the young people who you're giving opportunities to, and the facility and the standards of which you hold your facility up to, you know, thank we you. just want to definitely, you know, give a heartfelt thank you to what you're doing. Thank you. And, uh, you know, and you had to know that God is using you for something, Absolutely. you know, he's Absolutely. using you for something for something mm -hmm. but um as i say i am purpose i got that from my boy luther 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 um luther mercer want to say what's up to you and a shout out but thank you thank you for listening and watching the journey we're gonna keep bringing them because we got some amazing brothers in the city of memphis till the next time Thank you to our partners at Nike's Black Community Commitment and Methodist Laboner Healthcare. To hear more incredible stories like this, be sure to download the Kazookian app from the App Store or Google Play, or check out the Journey Memphis podcast on all your major podcast providers. Also, check us out on the Kazookian Network. Mm -hmm.